Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of The Narrow Bed by Sophie Hanna. So, uh, Sophie Hanna is the author who was chosen by the Agatha Christie estate to continue writing new Agatha Christie books. She's also a very accomplished uh, crime thriller writer herself. Uh, and I am going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to check out some of my tabs. I only actually have three to start you on, and then I'll kind of update you as I read it. And then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. I will say the back of it's peeling off, and this is driving me crazy. I kind of want to kind of want to peel that bit of plastic look, but hey ho. Anyway, the blurb. Dane reads. A killer that the police are calling Billy Deadmates is murdering pairs of best friends one by one. Before they die, each victim is given a small white book. For months, detectives have failed to catch Billy or work out what the white books mean. And then a woman, scared by what she's seen on the news, comes forward. Stand-up comedian Kim Trebek has one of Billy's peculiar little books. A stranger gave it to her at a gig she did a year ago. Was he Billy and does he want to kill her? Kim has no friends and trusts no one. How and why could she possibly be Billy Deadmates' next target? Um, so the important thing to mention there, Billy No Mates is a phrase we use in the UK for somebody who doesn't have any friends. And she actually talks in this about why, <laughs> whether that translates internationally or not. We also have a character in this who is very, very feminist and she, uh, I'm just going to read, this is part of one of her opinion pieces, uh, same old story, Misogyny Kills by Sandra Halliday. She makes some good points but she's one of those kind of abrasive feminists where she doesn't think that men and women should be equal, she thinks that women are superior to men, which in my view is just as bad as misogyny. But anyway, um, as I say, she does also make some good points. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you, this, this is three paragraphs here from this opinion piece that she did. That's right folks, he might have killed two pairs of best friends, but it's telling that the police are pushing that angle so hard, isn't it? We know that nearly all of the violence in our patriarchal woman-hating society is male. This isn't a controversial feminist assertion, it's a simple fact. Toxic masculinity is responsible for more than 90% of fatal assaults in the UK. The overwhelming majority of murders of women are committed by men. Yet, yeah, again and again, the police and the media conspire to conceal what's going on, which is nearly always the same thing, lethal male violence against women and girls. Here we have a killer who has killed three women. Please note, there is no need for the helpful among you to submit comments along the lines of, but one victim was a man, don't forget Joshua Norbury. That doesn't change my fundamental point. It's an outrage that a male killer can murder three women and be reported as having done so all over the national media. And yet the words misogyny and male violence are not even mentioned. It was the same when Godfrey Cornish murdered his daughter, Holly. Why are we so reluctant to name this plague that's claiming more and more lives all the time? Pernicious male brutality and the deeply entrenched belief among men that female lives don't matter. Why do those with the power to control the story reach instead for a nickname like Billy Deadmates that directs us, however subliminally, to side with the perpetrator rather than his victims? I'm aware that we don't know for sure that this killer is a man. The police haven't found him. He might be a woman. Oh, come all ye mansplainers and men's rights activists to tell me that women can be killers too. I don't deny that, but the fact is that the overwhelming majority of murderers in our society are male. I don't believe the police would have coined the nickname Billy Deadmates if they believed there was an equal chance of the culprit being a woman. And we actually get a conversation amongst the police among why they chose this name. Um, and they pointed out that Billy can be a female name as well as a male name. And they also kind of throw some shade towards this radical feminist being like, well, she actually stands to benefit if there's some a dude going around killing women because it gives us something to complain about. Which I'm like... I don't know if that's enough to suspect somebody of murder, mate. Anyway, um, Charlie goes to uh, a coffee place, so we get this. The tea, to be fair, was delicious, as with the chocolate and beetroot cake. Still, Charlie was sceptical about drink, shop and do. A comma and an ampersand in the name of a cafe. It was too fussy. Anyone who chose that name had to have something not quite right about them. I agree. Maybe the person who named that was the killer. And I, I like this because... I mean, this is relatable. I'm at that age now where, I mean, admittedly, I am also single, but I quite like having my own bed. Um, and actually, the scene as this is called the narrow bed, that's potentially a clue there. But also, there's a reference to Gogglebox here, which helps to date this as being fairly recent. Uh, One day, Gabe and I realised our marriage wouldn't fall apart if we didn't share a bed all night, every night. It would fall apart later for other reasons. We could still have sex on the sofa, usually, with Gogglebox on in the background. And then we could both get a decent night's sleep in different rooms, two floors apart. This discovery thrilled us both. Enjoy your smug laughter while you can, youngsters. Sleep matters. You'll realise that once you turn 40. This kind of thing will happen to you too. Mate, I'm 32 and I still feel that. So here are main characters talking about 
what it's like to live alone after being living with a partner. So she goes, Normally I love turning my key in the front door and knowing that everything will be exactly as I left it. I used to dread coming home when I lived with Gabe, and not only because of Gabe himself. There were all the tiny irritations to contend with, the bin liner attached only to one side of the kitchen bin, drooping down low on the other. The jar of Nescafe with a gold foil seal only half torn away. Because why waste time tearing off the whole thing when you can shake the coffee powder out of one side of the jar forever? Oh, and so somebody sends this feminist writer a copy of Beloved by Toni Morrison, um, which I want to read at some point. And um, basically the killer's been sending his victims like lines of poetry, so the pairs of friends get pairs of lines from the same poem. Um, so we get this. I wanted to ask you, did the two pairs of best friends Billy killed get lines from the same poem as me and the cancer ward notice board, or as each other? As each other, says Gibbs. First two, the lines came from a poem by a woman called Emily Dickinson. Second pair, the writer was an Ella Wheeler Wilcox. Both poems, like yours, were about death. And all three by female American poets whose first names begin with E. Do you think that means something? He's not looking at me and sounds as if he's asking himself. I've no idea. I mean, if you want American women poets who write about death, why not pick Sylvia Plath? She's the obvious one. Very true, she is. She talks about a nightmare she had where she found herself in a lift with the manufacturer's name Schindler and blazed across its interior wall. This prompted many comments about how you shouldn't really joke, should you? But it was rather an unfortunate name for a lift, wasn't it? Schindler's Lift. And she says when she first met Gabe, uh, he proudly declared himself to be the if you kiss anyone else it's over type, and I showered him with good natured ridicule for it. And her ex, her ex um, is a stoner and, and she goes uh, Most people are on your side, they say nothing wrong with using marijuana to stupefy yourself day in day out Soon it'll be fully legal everywhere What a depressing thought And we get a short story um, that's in including this There's a lot of this like, m I guess like meta text where the, sto the novel has excerpts from fictional books and stuff And this is from a story but I thought this was a really interesting um, paragraph the simple truth is this, if we put our energies into anger, fighting, disapproval and condemnation, we're unlikely to end up making the world a better place. The only way we can do that is by contributing our positive energy, our love, kindness and compassion. Many who are full of anger and hate, many who feel the need to be forever at war, attach themselves to undeniably good causes as a sort of disguise. Look, we say to ourselves, that person must be doing it right. She's spending all her free time attacking whatever the particular appalling thing might be. But no, if the impulse is an attack impulse, it can only do harm. All right, that's basically all I've got for you for the narrow bed. It is now like a year after I filmed that last part of the review and I finally got around to editing and we're missing a part. But overall, it was like a 3.5 out of 5 competently written thriller. Sophie Hannah, what more do you want? So there we have it. That's what I made of The Narrow Bed by Sophie Hanna. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you read it, hit that like button. If you enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more. And I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.